Hello and welcome to the Main Question Podcast. I'm Ron Lisnett and I'm thrilled and honored to once again be the host of this show. This is episode one of our ninth season. And for those of you who have tuned in before, you may notice some changes around here. We've mixed things up a bit. For those watching us on Main's YouTube channel or another social media outlet, the studio we are in will be our new home and the flagship of sorts for our podcast. This space will allow us to add an enhanced video-based production to the podcast, bring in multiple guests, and allow us to use visuals to help tell the stories that we share. But we're not forgetting those of you who listen to audio podcasts only. We will still have those available on the traditional platforms we've always used, Apple and Google Podcasts, Spotify, and SoundCloud. And we may add a few others along the way as we move along this season. We'll keep you posted. So, on to our first episode, and our topic today is a really small one, but one that could have a huge impact on the main economy and just about every aspect of modern life as we've come to know it. Today, we are talking about nanocellulose. So let's dive right into that. Well, we'd like to welcome you all here. Appreciate you joining us. Maybe if you can introduce yourself, tell us your title, and maybe just a sentence or two about what you look at, what, what's, your, what's your focus here uh, in, with work you do at the University of Maine. Mike, let's start with you. Sure, my name is Mike Mason. I'm a professor in chemical and biomedical engineering at UMaine. I'm also the associate director for the Graduate School for uh, Biomedical Science and Engineering. Um, my lab is inter uh, primarily interested in defining uh, physical properties at the nanoscale. And historically, that hasn't meant like biomaterials, like what we're talking about here today, generally with cellulosic kind of materials. But um, in the last few years, I got excited about this material system, just like everybody else. And so now we're looking at different ways that we can modify surface, look at properties on short length scale, and utilize that to make new materials. <laughs> Colleen, you're with the PDC. We'll get to what that means, yeah. but just tell us a little, uh, you know, who you are and, and where you, what your title is. I'm Colleen Walker. I am director of the Process Development Center. So we are a center in chemical and biomedical engineering. We work primarily with industry on con and do contract research for industry. Great. And Mehdi? Yeah, my name is Mehdi Tajwidi. I'm an associate professor here. Renewable Nanomaterials is my uh, official title. Mm -hmm. And uh, what I do is that my job is to find applications for nanocellulose that Colleen produces. <laughs> uh, right. On a large scale. So she's the supplier and you... Yeah. Yeah. Right. To find right. customers. Right. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you so much. I, I thought to try to describe what we're going to talk about here, it's, it's a little bit uh, daunting because it's such a huge topic and there's so many different ways we could go. So I thought what I'd do is read the, uh, from the article that Ashley Forbes did in this Humane Today magazine from a couple of years ago talking about nanocellulose. And I think it really sort of sets the scene for, for what we're going to talk about. So this is Ashley Forbes, her introduction to, to the article. She says, to understand what nanocellulose is and what it could be, all you have to do is look at the world around you. That tree outside your window, the plants in your garden, the seaweed on the beach, the lettuce in your salad, that's where it comes from. In the very fiber of every plant and tree is a building block like no other, with the potential to be the next material that changes the world. Think about the introduction of nylon, polyester, or plastic. But this foundational material, nanocellulose, is natural, biodegradable, abundant, and renewable. To narrow it down, start with your basic needs, water, food, shelter. How could nanocellulose factor in? Filters made with nanocellulose could remove contaminants to provide clean, safe drinking water. Packaging made with nanocellulose offers properties that can keep food fresher longer. Materials made with nanocellulose could form the structure of your home and at least some part of nearly everything in it. It reminds me of that Saturday Night Live commercial way back with Dan Aykroyd or Chevy Chase. I can't remember, but they used to do those commercials, you know, ripoffs of commercials, and one was like, it's a floor wax. It's a dessert topping. It's both, <laughs> right? I mean, th is there anything that, that this can't do? I mean, so let's just talk about it. Um, what is nanocellulose? Let's break down the term. Nano and then cellulose. Nano is really small, but how small is it? How, how small are we talking? Oh, you want me to take you on take that? that. Yeah. Well, I give this example. I say one human hair is almost 100 microns on average in thickness. Right. right? And 100 microns is 100,000 nanometers. So basically, you can fit 100,000 nanometers in the thickness of one human hair. So that's the scale we're talking about. Wow. And cellulose uh, comes from all the plants and trees around us, right? Yes, it's the most abundant natural polymer in the world. Right. right? It's in grass, trees, everything that we grow. So we can make this nanocellulose, then it's common in all those materials. Right. So 
Talk about the size. Mike, maybe you could talk about that, the size of the fibers. What, does that matter? Why does it matter? And is that what makes this material so versatile? Uh, yeah, absolutely. So like all nanomaterials, whether we're talking about you know, bio-derived nanomaterials like cellulose, it's a lot about the physical properties that are uh, unique or become really significant by reducing the size of the material, which is what we do, right? We're taking fiber, which comes from pretty much every plant source that you can imagine, and reducing the size. So imagine it's like a, a rope where you're peeling off strands that make up the rope. You end up with something that has a ton of surface area. And along that surface area, there's all kinds of chemical groups and predominantly oxygen and hydrogen. And because of all that extra surface area, it becomes a very reactive surface, a surface that you can modify. It can react with itself in different ways. Um, and, it's, and because of that, it's very versatile. And it can be made even smaller. I mean, we think of cellulose, you look it up, you get a picture of a molecule. What we're talking about is not molecular cellulose. Mm -hmm. It's actually a collection of polymer molecules. And, and the polymer molecule itself is a bunch of little sugar units. right? So it's a chain that we're then kind of coiling into a fibril. And then those fibrils are, you know, in nature, make up fiber and bigger fiber and then plant cell walls and then, you know, tree. Right. Now, I think we're, we're probably going to have some acronyms coming up here. So nanocellulose is sort of an umbrella term. I've heard CNF. I've heard nanofibrils, uh, nanocrystals. Uh, can you, somebody untangle that for us here? <laughs> I, I, okay. I'm teaching this course this year. So okay, right. all right. Yeah, right. yeah so basically um, there are two main types of nanocellulose. One is cellulose nanofibrils or cellulose nanofibers or CNF. The other one is cellulose nanocrystals or CNCs. Depending on where you come from in the world, you might, might call it differently, but those are the two main ones. So the nanofibrils are the ones that are normally produced mechanically by the fibrillation of the structure of the plant cell wall into smaller particles, whereas the CNCs are the ones that are mostly made by chemical acid hydrolysis, by removing the impurities and all the amorphous parts, and you end up with the crystals that are the building blocks of making the plant cell wall. So in the intro, we talked, talked about, you know, this basically all the necessities of life, it seems like this material can, can have an effect on that. So talk about some of the uses, you know, uh, packaging, uh, medical, building materials, uh, filtering water. I mean, can this material really do all of that very effectively? Anybody? I guess it's a big question, yeah. so we can break it into parts. I can talk later after other people talked about their application, but I, I can talk about building products and maybe right. a little bit about water filtration. Yeah. Well, Mike, let's start yeah. with you. I mean, we'll, we'll get into some show and tell and, and more dive into more sure. specifics later, but your basic area, I mean, what can nanocellulose do for what you're working on? Yeah. So we're, I, I would say it might be useful for a lot of things. I mean, I think that's kind of what we're trying to understand is what it actually is useful for. Okay. I mean, so the fact that you're starting with something that already is like a fiber means that you can think of it as like a fiber reinforcing material uh, because it's covered with hydroxyl groups that like each other. It likes to stick to itself, which means it's kind of like an adhesive. So it's like a structural element and a glue at the same time. Uh, it's, a, it's a polymer. Uh, which means a lot of different things. It's not necessarily the same as common plastics that we're used to because it's not necessarily what we would call thermoplastic, which means you heat it up and it melts and you can reform it. It doesn't necessarily behave like that, but it has some of properties of all of those things, you know, reinforcing materials, adhesives, and fiber network-like materials like you would use for like filtration, stuff like that. So as far as what I'm looking at, I'm looking at essentially applications in the health medical space, including like dental and veterinary where there are current materials that are maybe over-engineered out of like metals or petroleum-derived plastics that are meant to live forever, but we're moving towards a lot of single-use materials in healthcare now. And over-engineered materials means that they're, just, they're meant to be used over and over and over, but single-use is contrary to that definition. Right. So we're saying, is this a material system that is biodegradable? It's made from a biological source that's heavily managed. It's a sustainable you know, source material, wood. It's not a food product. We don't have to take corn to make stuff. We can get it from trees, which is great. And is it just right for the application, but only that application? So we're kind of broadly looking in that space. Yeah. Colleen, what have you looked at in terms of applications for this material? We, we mostly focus on a, um, paper and packaging applications. That's where the process development fo focuses. And there it's, uh, it's a really easy add-in because paper makers are already using cellulose fiber to make paper and packages. 
um, like your, your regular boxes. So it's very easy for them to take this technology, they can pull a slipstream from their regular manufacturing, make the cellulose nanofiber and add it back in. And they can displace fiber if they um, choose to do that to make the same product, or they can actually get an increase in some of the properties to make an enhanced product in, in that. Right. People think of paper, they think of, you know, printer paper, right. but there's paper that wraps up your hamburger when right. you go get takeout right. or any other number of uses. So, I mean, there's a lot of applications just within the, the exactly. realm of paper, right? And the, the, some of the unique properties that this material has is it's great at providing grease resistance. That's something in an area where Medi works as well. And um, it has great oxygen barrier properties. So those are two things that plastic properties that plastic provides. So we're really excited about looking at this material to see in food packaging, particularly in some other pack packaging applications where we can leverage those properties with this material. Yeah. Now, Mehdi, what are you looking at? I know a lot of forest products and, and enhancing those, right? Yeah, well, my background is in wood and paper science and technology. So I belong to the forest products community. So my uh, my main focus is to give back to the community. So I'm thinking nanosilos is coming from forests, so how we can get it back to the forest products industry. And we all know about the issues that forest products industry is facing. Um, so I see nanosilos as a uh, enabling technology that can actually enable new products and innovation in the forest products. And also it can enhance properties of the current products that we have. So one of the issues with traditional like compressed panels, as we call them, like particle board and fiber board, is a synthetic resin that is used there. It normally contains formaldehyde, which is not good. So uh, one of my early focuses was to look at how we can replace that synthetic part of the forest-based material, which is the resin, and replace it with uh, nanocellulose. As Mike mentioned, it has very good binder applications or properties. So we took that one first uh, and then developed that idea into all different types of building products uh, because we realized that some products are easier to, uh, to attack, some others are more difficult to get to. So, and then in the meantime, we were working with other people like Doug Bosfield at the uh, Chemical Engineering Department who were working on coatings and those things and we realized about the uh, excellent oxygen and grease barrier properties and we were thinking how we can get these together and then we got back into packaging world again. <laughs> right. So kind of from building back to the packaging. So that's where I am now. Right. And just to, to break it down, we're going to have some show and tell later with you as well, but the glue, which used to be have some pretty nasty stuff in it, like formaldehyde, is now made from wood products yeah. and is totally recyclable. Yeah, so. It's basically wood that is binding wood. So we are using uh, wow. the same wood to right. bind particles of wood together to make something. Right. New. So these are all, you know, promising ideas, but the the, the holy grail, of course, is to develop this into a business and an industry and products. So can let's talk about the, the opportunity to develop products and technology here in Maine. Is Maine uniquely situated to do this? Do we have the infrastructure? We have paper mills all over the state. Um, is Maine situated to go big with this? That's like a, a leading question for my perfect answer. Uh, okay, when, have when, at it. When I first, I've been at UMaine for about five years when I first arrived, and I've worked in this nanocellulose space for a number of years. Um, it just, when I got here, I was like, this is nanocellulose valley. <laughs> right. Because uh, when you look at the researchers on campus, like Mike was working with it, Medi was working with it. Um, so you have that, that, like in Silicon Valley, you have that university that has all this knowledge. And then you look at the community around Maine. What does Maine do? We, we are experts here at, at managing our forests and, and, and getting that wood out of the forest. We have that workforce. It's just like why Silicon Valley grew up, because they had the people and they had the knowledge. Um, and I think the other thing that really makes Maine unique to grow in this space is because a lot of Mainers have a great entrepreneurial spirit and they're really fond of doing something that's green and right for the, the planet and the land. So I really think that makes Maine really unique, and you can see that. We have a lot of people at the University of Maine using this material, a lot of interest around the community, so we just hope to see that grow. Right. Anybody care to add? I, if, yeah, if, I'll, yeah, I'll add something to that. So I mean, I think for, for some applications, um, a lot of what Maddie does, and I'd say some of the biomedical applications that we're looking at, the scale of, de of potential demand gets to the point where it does make sense to look at former mill sites, you know, making mm -hmm. use of some of the infrastructure in the state right. of Maine that is on the verge of collapsing in some places. You know, those sites are ideal. I mean, they have cheap energy. 
They have all that infrastructure. There are some sites that potentially have some of the existing equipment that we can use. And that's maybe where we source a lot of the raw materials that we need. So we, we could co-localize some of these small ideas around those spaces, taking advantage of all that forestry infrastructure. Yeah, I want to get back to the the idea of a biorefinery. We're going to exactly. talk about that yeah, yeah. later. But, I mean, when you talk about nanocellulose valley being, a you know, a, a sort of a stepchild of Silicon Valley, I mean, how big can we dare to talk about this? Is, is that really sort of reality that this could become a major industry here? I, it, well, you hope, right? Like all things you right. hope, but the potential is so huge. And there's so many people looking at this material all mm -hmm. around the world. It's not just Maine. It's all around the world that people are excited. And there's the bigger pool because now people are looking for sustainable materials. People want to move away from plastics, want to move away from these more harmful components. And again, we have that knowledge here. We've been working in this space for a very long time. So you can easily see that that, that would grow up, um, that we could have this vibrant business around this material. What are the hurdles that are in the way of that? Obviously, more research has to be done to develop the products and the technology. What else? Investment, uh, you know, a re people power, you know, uh, uh, workforce. What, what, what else are we talking about that we need? I, I, can, I can jump on that. Yeah, please, please do. I, more experience I, I, mean, I, I can tell you that there are a few really promising products that are still at what we would call bench scale or maybe small demonstration scale that are close to being ready for something, I think, interesting to happen. But we don't have the resource back, backbone to do that. Like, we, we don't have CNF at scale. We don't have some of the technologies mm -hmm. to, like, change its shape or form to, like, dried CNF. There's, a, there's one hurdle that's really tricky for us, and that's how do you go from CNF that's made as a suspension in water that's almost all water. It's like 97% water or let's say 90 plus percent water. How do you get that all the way down to zero water? It's very expensive. So that's a hurdle at scale. Right. And, and that's something that honestly we need help with. And we're working on. Yeah. There's, oh, no, there's it's, projects. It, we're, gonna, we're keeping moving on that. But yeah. ultimately that could take some sizable investment. Yeah. yeah. But so, on the other hand, there are applications where we call wet applications where you don't really have to dry the nanocellulose before you use it in the right. final product. Right. And that's one area that I'm mostly working on. Oh, great. So the PDC, we, we were going to get back to that. Just talk about what the PDC does. You talked about it a little bit, but right now you're making a lot of nanocellulose for Mike and Medi and others to use. How much are you able to make, and what part does that play in what the PDC does? Uh, well, we, we've just done an upgrade to our pilot plant, so now we can do it at a very comfortable level. We can make a half a ton a day which is not pushing the barriers. We could make a lot more of that if we wanted to work a longer than eight hour shift, say. Right. The PDC's made about close to 30 tons of this dry material, dry, dry tons. Um, we've shipped it all over the world for commercial trials, which is really pretty exciting. So the PDC provides that role so that we can supply large quantities for uh, companies that want to run on a commercial scale for them to try that product. So we've been doing that for a long time. Right. I, I know uh, a while back we were uh, visiting you and there was a, a company trying to make yogurt cups, yes, right? Yeah. It, and, and so, I mean, if you just think how many yogurt cups are thrown away plastic every day, I right. mean, that would be, that alone would be a huge market, right? Right. Yeah. And that's looking, um, that's looking at the molded pulp space, but we're really excited to look how we can take the cellulose nanofiber and put it into those products. Because a lot of people are looking at that technology to move from plastic to a, a paper solution. Right. Because right now, a paper cup, would, it wouldn't last in the store right. or in your lunchbox, probably, right? Right. right. So let's uh, maybe dig in a little bit on some of the, the uh, products and the technologies that you both are working on. And we, if you want to pull out some, uh, some show and tell here, Mike, maybe let's start with you. You okay. talked about biomedical I applications. I in the meantime. Sure. Yeah, go ahead. <laughs> I have um, show and tell, too. So, <laughs> oh, that's right. Okay. So, so, so let me just start by saying that, interestingly, you know, a lot of biomedical applications don't differ a lot from other commercial applications other than... Uh, the material has to be kind of shown to perform in a certain way in that setting. So a lot of what we do is about, you know, how do we prove that it starts out sterile or is it sterilizable? Um, can we track the lifetime of the material before it actually makes its way into that product? And that just kind of raises the bar, but it's very, you know, structurally very similar. So you'll see a lot of similarities. So let's see, I have, I have a few. All right, so again, these are all medical applications. Okay. So, so this is a, a foam fiber material that is used for biological spills. So essentially it's a sponge. It's a single use, you throw it on, the, on a wetted area, surgical suite, it sucks up all the biofluid, 
This particular one is just neat, which means it's nothing but fiber, but we also make them with uh, antimicrobial properties as well as part of that material system. So this is just a cleanup thing, you, you right. could say. Uh, that same idea we use for materials, and this is like a bulk sheet, this is like a raw product, where this is part of a device that uses something that wicks fluid intentionally, kind of analogous to like a pregnancy test, which is a lateral flow membrane, which the fluid moves along the surface and through the surface as well. This is kind of part of something along those lines. And similarly, again, same technology, this is the actual membrane for a lateral flow pregnancy test. All right, again, all just wood. There's nothing but wood in any of those. Wow. All right, now a, a little more technical. So this is our attempt, and I'll say this is an ongoing project sponsored by the National Science Foundation. We're building um, a replacement to polyurethane foam for which there's something like close to a million tons thrown in landfills mm -hmm. a year just for medical uses. All right, so this is something that's used to make a surgical support. So let's say you're having like neck or back surgery or shoulder surgery where they need to immobilize you. They use a huge amount of really low quality polyurethane foam just to kind of lock you into place so you can't move. All right, this is kind of like a, a benchtop scale version of that material. It's just like a foam, but single use only. And unlike polyurethane, it doesn't last forever. Right, so that is, is that compostable? Yeah, you can eat that. There's nothing in that, nothing in that but cellulose. Wow, okay. Right, so that get your daily fiber. Yeah, well, maybe more than you want. <laughs> right. But for sure. Um, kind of moving down that same pathway, the same technology that we use for those materials, rather than expand it as a foam, if we design it in a way that it condenses upon itself, we take advantage of all that hydrogen bonding, we end up with materials that are very, very rigid. So this is a, this is a machinable uh, material designed to make a component that you would use for maybe like a therapeutic device, maybe even as far as like a surgical implant someday, I would say. Right, so that's kind of a, a raw material. Um, along that same line, given that you know, this is an FDA compliant process if we were to do that, we also have a material that we use that surgeons use to train for surgeries that is morphologically and structurally similar to bone. Right, so it feels the same, it cuts the same, it drills the same, it looks the same. Right? Wow. So that's a training tool. And these are, these are basically like, like bone. If you look on the inside of these things, uh, see if I have one, you can look on the inside of these things. So I'm not sure I brought a great example. Here's a crumb, crummy one. So here's a piece of that material that's basically like an analog to bone. And this is what it looks like on the inside. And it looks like the trabecular bone, the part of bone that's all, you know, it's like, like a, a broken bone. It's yeah. like a broken bone. Yeah, and, and we, we intentionally break everything, right? We have to prove that it's tough like bone. Yeah. So these are all been mechanically tested. Um, these are examples of like a bone plug. If you have a diabetic neuropathy where they have to cut out parts of bone because of disease, you can plug it with a hole, saw it off, and it will, it will help bone cells regrow. Right, so that's another pretty high-end application. And that's not uh, going to be rejected by uh, a, a person's, you know. I'll say hopefully not. Right. Um, but that's where we are with the research. Right. right. That's kind of where we are. Is how, do we, how do we ensure that that isn't rejected because it's a foreign body within you, but also chemically because it aligns with what your body needs to grow cells, right, to right. make cells happy. And that is where the science is, I would say. That's the tricky part. Right. Um, that same material, if we don't necessarily dewater it, meaning we leave it as a, as a suspension of gel, these are hydrogel beads that are meant to be implanted as a vaccine delivery vehicle. So this is a depot for drugs. And this is part of a couple projects that are going on with, you, with USDA, a couple other collaborators at Cooperative Extension working with uh, aquaculture, for example, and also um, some like dermal applications. So uh, shallow skin abrasion, small wounds, not what we'd call like a large wound, for example. So to deliver medicine. Yes, yeah, it's a drug. It's a little payload and this one's injectable. So this is a sheer thinning liquid that you can inject it and it becomes a fluid and then it gets firm once it's in position. Wow. So it stays put. So that's what those guys are. And that's, that is not loaded with a drug. That's a dye that we use to track how well it works. Right. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, some other examples of some rigid materials similar to these. There's some like rib bone and some other examples that we would mock up. But one of the things that is kind of in this whole conversation is not just 100% cellulose materials, but using cellulose as an additive in things like thermoplastic. Right? So that, I think, has a lot of promise for early adoption. So right now, we can use uh, medical-grade plastics, very high-performing materials for very specific applications, and we can replace 20 30% of that plastic with cellulose. Right, that's an easy adopting material. I mean, you're not asking industry to change anything. Like, we're going to send you an injection moldable resin that's ready to go tomorrow. Right, that's an example of something where we just need to get to scale. Right. Now, is that w w the advantage of that other than it's a natural material is 
cost or efficiency or, or what, what is the advantage? So we do get a, a little bit better improvement in some mechanical <coughs> properties like stiffness. Again, you're adding fiber to something that's otherwise pretty amorphous. So you're adding it like a reinforcing material, so which means in some applications you can use less plastic, right? You can make something thinner and still have the same stiffness characteristic. Okay. Um, but to answer your question, yeah, it's because it's greener. That's part of it. But sadly, if the price point isn't in the right ballpark, that's just not going to happen. Right. And the way we get there is to go to scale. Yeah. Right. Mehdi, what, what do you have to show us here? Yeah, can I use which space? Can I? Yeah, let's uh, <laughs> clear some space here. So you He's can... got the big stuff. Oh, okay. I didn't bring the big stuff. I put it <laughs> so my story goes back to about 2014 when we wrote a grant to U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities, or also known as P3 Nano, and asked for funding to use nanosados, or CNF, basically, as uh, a binder to replace the urea formaldehyde resin in panels. And they got back to us and said, yeah, that's a great idea, but how on earth are you going to get all that water out of this material? It's 97% water. And I honestly did not know the answer. So I go to my lab and I get some of CNF in my hand. I try to squish the water out and it doesn't do that. You know, water just stays there. It holds so tenaciously to water. And then I mix it with some wood particles, which was the plan, and then I see the magic happen. You know, just pure water flowing from between my fingers. And now we have a name for this phenomenon. We call it contact dewatering. It's basically the process that changes all that bound water, which is closely interacting with the surface of the nanosados, <coughs> changing that into free water. Now it is mechanically removable. So that helps a lot with the process because you can take about 50% of the water in a few minutes without using heat energy. So it makes it really interesting to do. So we started that project making uh, particle board panels. You know, particle board is made with particle wood particles bonded with a resin, normally urea formaldehyde. And the first samples that we made were just a one inch by one inch because we didn't know how to do that. Then we scaled that up to something like this. This is a, panel, a particle board panel uh, made with nanocellulose as a binder. That one has about 15% nanocellulose in it. The rest is just wood. There's no other additives. Then we just scaled that up with the help of people at the Forest Products Lab in Madison, Wisconsin. We did larger sizes, uh, that's uh, one foot by one foot. Uh, and then uh, we actually used the four by eight feet pan, uh, per panel press uh, at the Composite Center at the ASCC uh, at UMaine to make uh, one panel, which took us about six hours to produce. Okay, six hours to produce one panel. Um, Again, it was all for the proof of concept. It worked really well. The properties were similar or better than regular panels. But the problem was that the particle board is actually a dry process. So you can't go to the manufacturer and say, hey, change your dry process to a wet process and do this. That's not going to fly. So we were looking for another application that actually uses a, dry, a wet process, and that was gypsum board or drywall. Wall board. Yeah, wall yeah, board. Right. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's a wall board application now. So it's a similar thing. We have the same core of the material, mm -hmm. but the faces are now like uh, paper. So similar to a wall board. And uh, this one, you can make wall board much uh, lower density, lighter, and stronger. At the same time, it has one of the benefits that wall board doesn't have. If you ever try to put a nail in a wall board, you see that it can easily come out. Mm -hmm. right. That doesn't happen with this one. So, so that's, uh, that's one of so the- So your pictures benefits. won't fall off the wall. Yes. Yeah. Good. Yes. Uh, so we were looking at how we can take these ideas and actually scale this up. And we have a good collaborator from the industry that actually allowed us to scale this process up into a fiber board production. We did it in the smallest scale. We made fiber boards like these. These are low density installation panels. Uh, and uh, these are, this is another sample of that. So these have only, this one has only 2.5% CNF as binder. The rest is just wood fibers. It is similar to the installation panel that are being made here in Maine now and commercially. So that the glue, the glue is the wood is gluing the wood. wood yes, yeah. wood wow. is going back to wood. Uh, and just recently, back in uh, April, we actually worked with our uh, industrial partner and we made these panels. These are commercial, commercially made on act, on an actual line. And within that six hours that it took us to make the, six, the first one, one. one panel, right. we actually made. 5,300 of those panels in six hours. Wow. And that's the scale that now we are at. Is that close to like a commercial rate? That is a close to commercial yeah, rate, right. yeah. 
So, so that's where we are with the, uh, the nanocellulose application as a binder in uh, wood-based panels. And so these are all, uh, you know, building materials that are used every day. Yeah. Every house, every office, yep. uh, any structure you build sure. needs this kind of thing. That's true. Um, and in line with that, uh, again, uh, we, as I said, we have been always been uh, impressed by the properties of nanocellulose as a, a grease or oil barrier. And uh, some years ago, we developed, a, we, we were thinking how we can take this idea mm -hmm. and make it into another application that actually takes advantage of both, both binder and barrier properties of nanocellulose. And that was when we talked, then thought about uh, the packaging application, molded fiber, mm -hmm. as my colleague mentioned. And uh, so basically, if you get this one and make it thinner and replace this surface paper with nanocellulose, you end up having this material now. So this is a molded fiber uh, uh, container that does not use pulp to make molded fiber. It actually uses wood flour or sawdust. And that sawdust is bonded together using nanocellulose, and then you have a layer of CNF on the surface to give it grease barrier performance. So this could be waste wood, but you know, yeah, th waste wood, that yeah. it's not coming from trees that are going into lumber, it's coming from... Yeah, at this time, waste wood is just burnt, Right. but uh, you can technically use it to, to, to replace uh, uh, pulp, which is on, on price, uh, comparison is very different. So if I wanted to go get sushi takeout tonight, mm -hmm. it could eventually come with, with this as the, tr as the container? Yeah. Wow. You know, the oil resistance of nanocellulose is so good that it, it's, not, it's, not, it's beyond barrier. It's actually a container. I mean, we have had samples of oil in a cup that we made in the lab sitting there for six months, and oil was there. Never leaked. Never leaked until I actually tipped it over accident. <laughs> <laughs> Not technically. But with that, there's nothing can fix that. Yeah. Yeah. Now, Colleen, you have some, uh, yeah, well, some have goodies time, to show us? Do you have a time for a demonstration? Uh, well, sh sure. Oh, well, I, I guess. Well, what I brought is some of the paper, just, and it's a great lead-in that Met Mehdi did, with, um, to show you the, the, dip, the grease barrier properties. So this is a piece mm. of uh, paper that's been coated with cellulose nanofiber, except the edges are not coated with the cellulose nanofiber. And here I just got some mazola corn, oh, oh corn oil. corn oil. So uh, very. <laughs> now let's make sure we can get a shot of that. Is that in yeah. a place, guys, that we can, I can uh, move that we can in. get? I can remove yeah, these, let's take so some of this out yeah. and so, let's put it. Should we put it in the middle of the table yep. here? Yep. It's just oh. kind of fun to see. So if yeah, we. Yeah put a d drop on these edges where it's just a normal piece of paper you can just watch it go right through right see it what's the paper and then this sur top surface is the CNF on it and you'll Look see at it that. just sits there so that and that's just the cellulose nanofiber no chemicals no other additions and maybe it looks like it might have a little bit of hole so let it. me ask a question uh, there's been a lot of talk about PFAS and that material is used to do this function, yeah. so now we don't have to use PFAS for this anymore, right. correct? It's, it's an exciting thing to look at. How can we use the cellulose nanofiber to add those grease barrier properties that PFAS used right. to do? Yeah, PFAS, I mean, we've talked about that in other yeah. podcasts, and of course that is, they're known as forever chemicals, and they're right. not good to have in the environment, and they're everywhere, and they become a big problem. And I don't have a demonstration for it, but another application that we've been supporting is uh, one of our researchers at the composite centers looked at using cellulose nanofiber as uh, an element to d extinguish fires. Mm -hmm. Believe it or not, you can throw some cellulose nanofiber on a fire and it'll put it out and it will not restart. So it's amazing. pretty exciting. Wow. And then the other um, thing I wanted to show you, uh, one of the things that the Process Development cen Center does is we distribute cellulose nanofiber um, around the world for people to develop applications. So we work very well with the folks at University of Maine, but we distribute it to other places around the world. Uh, that want to look at it. And um, you'll see I have some very unique things to bring in now because these, uh, it struck me when um, the third artist walked into our facility and wanted to buy cellulose nanofiber. I was kind of blown away when that happened. But the artist community, and this is one of, um, from Walter Greenleaf, he's doing a uh, MFA. Uh, what's and this is another piece, some pieces that you can see from artists. This is from Marcel Sims that has made this from cellulose nanofiber. Artists get extremely excited about this material because for them it's something that they can stick their hands in, they can work with, and they don't have to worry about any 
types of toxic components and right. volatile elements. So it's really kind of exciting that, that these people get terribly excited about this because they see the shapes that Mike shows with his products, they see the shapes that Medi shows, and then their artistic brains get going. How else can we use this material? So I wow. just think it's really exciting That's great. to see some of these pieces. Right. Let's talk about uh, recycling and, and the, the source of this. So all of this is basically compostable or can be ground up and reused again, right? Mm -hmm. okay, exactly, yeah. And, and so there's no waste, there's no landfill problem. N none, of, none of that enters into the picture. Well, the, the, the samples that I showed you, these ones, you can actually put them back in water and then uh, mix them up and get your fibers and particles back and then form them again, make another plate. So wow. you can technically do that. And in terms of all, we, talked, we touched on plastic. It's everywhere, in our, you know, it's in the oceans, it's in, in, in just about every place you look. Does this material have, in, in many instances, uh, uh, the ability to replace plastic in our lives, single-use plastic like you talked about? In some applications, yeah. I mean, it's, its properties are, are super unique. There's no doubt about that. It doesn't necessarily perform the same way as a lot of what we think of as plastics. I mean, a lot of plastics, you can heat them up, melt them, reform them. Um, you know, they are plastic because they're deformable. Um, and, and some applications of cellulose, that's true. Um, some plastic products, yes, you know, it's easy to see how there's replacements, but plastic is also a pretty amazing is, class yeah. of material. Right. right. So the, the bar the bar is pretty high. Right. But if we can use this material targeting single use applications, and then ask the question of, you know, did we really need a material that's designed to last for a hundred thousand years for something that's going to be used for four minutes? Yeah, that's very true. It's yeah, massively over engineered most of ours. I mean, you know, Paul, your thing, like the examples I was showing, we produced in a single surgery like three or four garbage bags of foam poly polyurethane. It's always always takes up that much volume, right? Even if you uh, sterilize it before you ship it to the landfill, it's still this huge volume of material. This stuff, you put it in water, it just goes to nothing. It takes up, you know, a square inch or something for a bed sized piece of the foam material. Wow. Right. So certain applications, it's really great, but polyurethane is marketed because it's great and it lasts forever, which is why we use it for like cushions and things like that. Why do you need something that lasts forever for a surgery that lasts 15 or 20 minutes to a couple hours? You don't. Right. But we're using it because you can say, this is a great high performing material. We just need something that does its job. That's it. So the applications where we can target single use, short time use, or something that doesn't need to be, you know, a component on the space shuttle. I think there's a lot of low hanging fruit. Wow. So, uh, the, as we talked about, one of the hurdles to this moving forward is making enough of this material, right? Mm -hmm. So how much, you know, if, if some of these uh, products you talked about become a marketable item and a company needs, I don't know, five tons a year or something, is that one of the hurdles that needs to be cleared? We need somebody to, to make this material on a scale that could, could you know, uh, provide the resource for an industry to, to grow. Is that... Is that a, a, a hurdle that needs to be cleared? I guess you would say yes, because there isn't the, right now. If people need material to run trials, they have to come to us. You know, so we need somebody to um, go ahead and put that first play, that first manufacturing site in, so that there's a place where they can come and purchase material. The PVC we supply that need for people right now when they're trying to develop their applications with that. But it's one of those chicken and egg things that you know we have to get the markets ready and then have to find the nice the right site to put that facility hopefully in the state of Maine. Right. Uh, I wanted to ask about students. Uh, how how is this being taught or talked about in classes that are being taught here? Are uh, some of the engineering and other students you know going to be able to work with this material? They're the ones you know going uh, you know into the future that are going to be coming up with the ideas and and put it, and executing on all these right. Mm -hmm. Many teaches a class on cellulose. I should let you probably answer. Yeah, that yeah, yeah, yeah. Please, please I do. I do teach a graduate course on uh, nanocellulose and its composites, uh, which is pretty well received on campus. I, this year, I have 14 students in my class, which is a good size for a graduate level class. And uh, these students are mostly—I mean, they come from all across the campus. You know, I have food science students interested in food preservation or packaging. I, I have civil engineers. I have chemical engineers. I have chemistry students, you know, there are, um, it's, it's, it's a common thread that actually connects everyone together because uh, people see advantage in this. It is new. Everything you do in the, re in the area of nanoscience is new. I mean, mm -hmm. we're still exploring. There is, nanoscience is where plastics were some years ago. You know? so <laughs> yeah. 
you know, we are we are getting there. It's it's not it's not a competition, but it's a target that we are trying to get to. And all these projects that Mike and I are talking about, they're all student done. You know, yeah. students basically lead the projects and do that. We are just there to help. So graduate and undergrad. Yeah, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, that's great. So we sort of like to end with this sort of question on, on most of our episodes. Let's, let's go out five or ten years. The concept of a biorefinery, maybe define what that is. Is that what we're going to hope to see here in Maine? What, what would that look like? What, what could it look like? Well, my vision has always been to see one of these uh, sites in Maine that used to hold, hold a pulp mill be revitalized. We'd have our little you know, uh, cellulose nan nanofiber production plant. And that would be bringing in the wood chips or the wood residuals that we would need, produce that. And it'd be lovely to see little satellite businesses growing up around it that were taking that cellulose nanofiber and processing it to the, to the next step and then sending that on to the consumer. That's what we'd like to see. So are you going to, uh, are you going to trademark the term nanocellulose valley? <laughs> Put it on a T-shirt, right? It's already there, I guess. I think yeah. it is already. It probably is, right. Yeah. Well, this is exciting stuff and can't wait to see where it all goes. And thank you all for, for joining us. No Thanks problem. so much. Thank thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for this first episode of season nine. All upcoming and many past episodes are available on UMaine's YouTube channel. Every past episode is available to download and listen to on many of the platforms that most folks use out there these days, Apple, Google, Spotify, SoundCloud. And as we said, more may be coming. We're planning on a handful of episodes for the fall, probably about once a month, so stay tuned for what's next. If you have questions or comments, you can respond on YouTube or you can send them along to mainquestion at maine.edu. We'll catch you next time on The Main Question. <laughs>